Beautiful. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. We are heading back to our sermon series in the book of Ephesians, Stand Firm. If you're just joining us, we are in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, and we're going to be going to the end of chapter 3 and verse 21. Let's hear from the Lord this morning through his word. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful for your word. Thank you for examples like this where we get to see how Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, Lord. And I pray that today that by your spirit, the same spirit that was alive in the church in Ephesus, that's alive in our hearts here today, would stir our hearts to sing praises and to go before your feet in prayer more and more. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your great grace for us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, to those of you who are seated on this side of the room and looking at that screen today, uh, apologize for the technical difficulties we've been having. You know, our, um, uh, if you were here at the NCA Fine Arts Night this week, this screen was out. And so our, our, um, one of our staff members, James Drews, whoever sees this, searches around the country, finds two projectors because the projectors are old. Rush ships them here, puts in all kinds of extra hours yesterday to install two new projectors to make sure that what happened with that one doesn't happen to this one. And the one that wasn't bad, that got replaced, is bad. (laughs) And that's what happens sometimes, isn't it? You just like, you put in the time, you put in the effort, and then something goes bad. Well, while you didn't know it, he's still working feverishly behind the scenes and actually replaced that projector in the midst of hearing that beautiful uh, song that, that we were just doing, right? Praise God for James. Thank you. Anyway, we've got a great staff. I'm the volunteers. and just so proud to be a part of people who put in so much time and effort to, to make our worship experiences and everything that we do here uh, worthy, at least aiming at the excellence that the Lord's worthy of. Well, speaking of broken, let's talk about us. And... Uh, <laughs> Before we talk about us, let's talk about Bruce Springsteen. As Bruce Springsteen, he was born the only son in a middle-class family in Freehold, New Jersey. His home was literally a crumbling ruin of walls. There were no rules in the family. His father was very distant. There were a, a lot of issues there. He can remember as early as five years old, there just being no rules in the house, and he would stay up till 3 a.m., he would, go, he would stay, sleep in bed until three in the afternoon. He would eat whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And as he reflects back on his life, he had this to say in his memoir. He says, it was a place where I felt an ultimate security, a full license, and a horrible, unforgettable, boundaryless love. It ruined me and it made me. Later on in his life, he sought out therapy because he recognized he had this pattern of ruining and ending romantic relationships after about a two-year period of time, and he just kept doing this over and over. And and as he looked into himself through that process, uh, he discovered what, what the issue was, and this is what he said. He said, I wanted to kill what loved me because I couldn't stand being loved. It infuriated and outraged me. Someone having the temerity to love me. Nobody does that. And I'll show you why. It's been my experience in talking with many people over the years. And I think if I were to do a survey of you and ask you the question, 
the majority of you would say that it is easier to love somebody than it is to receive love from somebody. The fact is, when somebody tries to extend love to you, you have a hard time believing it. Because you think to yourself, if they, they don't really love me, because if they really knew what I was like, they would not act this way toward me. They would not demonstrate these actions toward me. You have a hard time receiving compliments because it so conflicts with your view of who you are. It's like an identity crisis when somebody tries to say something to you that's positive. You just don't believe it. Many of us have a difficult time being loved by other people. And the fact of the matter is that same issue we have receiving love from other people is actually true in our relationship with God as well. We have a hard time believing he actually could or actually does love us. Uh, Partly because we're aware of many reasons why he should not. And so like a rebellious child will frequently do in the home, we try to show God and prove to him all the reasons why we're not lovable. The passage we read today from Ephesians chapter 3 is of particular significance to our family. This particular prayer is one that uh, after each of our three children were born, Emily and I, as soon as the doctors or nurses handed us back the baby laid our hands on their head and prayed this prayer over each one of them. And why would we do that? What is it about this prayer? In short, there's nothing more I want for my kids than what the Apostle Paul is praying here in this prayer. The fact of the matter is I've been praying this prayer over you as well because there's nothing more I want for you for myself, for all of us together, than what the Apostle Paul is praying for in this prayer. And what exactly is that? Well, this is a prayer for the supernatural strengthening of Christians to be able to comprehend the power of God and the extent to which we are loved so that we would be filled with the fullness of God. That's a pretty complex, dense statement, and we're going to dig deeper into what that means as we work our way through the passage today. But before we do that, let's consider this. When we look at our own lives or the lives of our children, or maybe for those of you who are shepherds, the people that you're shepherding, sometimes we get focused on the the external behaviors, our own external behaviors, the external behaviors of the people we care about. And we find ourselves frustrated with ourselves or with one another saying things like, why don't you just stop treating people like that? Why don't you just tell the truth? Why do you keep returning to pornography? Why can't you stop overworking? Why don't you go out and do some work? Now, these external behaviors are all legitimate things that the Scripture talks about that we should have concern about. They're things that need to change, that we need to repent of as we see them at work in our own lives. But the fact of the matter is, if we focus our energy on the external behavior, we're going to miss the root of the problem. These things, are are acting out, all tends to stem from a root problem. And the root problem is that we fail to grasp to comprehend what we have been given in Christ. We fail to appreciate just how much we are loved. If you knew in the core of your being, like you know your own name, how much you are loved in Christ, you would not be tempted to go searching for love in all the wrong places. If you knew what treasure you have been given in Christ, you would not be tempted to go and collect all the material things you can find in this world. If you knew how loved you were in him, you would not be tempted to go and try and prove all the time how lovable you are by what you're accomplishing and achieving. Our fundamental problem is we don't know how much we are loved. And to whatever degree we do know it, we don't believe it's actually true. It can't be true. The Bible describes Jesus in the book of Revelation 
in this way. It describes him as him who loves us. Present tense, he loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Do you believe his love is a present reality for you in this moment as surely as he has freed you from your sins by his blood that he loves you with an everlasting love, with the kind of love that nothing in all of creation nor all of eternity will be able to separate you from? You don't believe it. I know you don't. And I don't either. And you see, no matter how much I try to convince you today and talk myself blue in the face to convince you that you're really loved with this kind of love, I can't make you believe it. I can't even make myself believe it. I can't make my kids believe it. I can teach you about it. I can, I can teach you the fundamentals of what this means, and I'm going to aim to do that today, but I can't make you know or comprehend this love, and that stinks. But God can. And that's why Paul prays. And that's why we ought to pray for ourselves, for our kids, for each other. That God will make us to know what we can't comprehend in and of ourselves. That's why he prays. Because God is not only able, but he seems perfectly willing to respond to our prayers to ask him to strengthen us, to comprehend, to become a dwelling place for Christ, to know his power, to know his love, and to be an, a vessel through which he brings glory to himself through endless ages. And so Paul begins his prayer this way in verse 14. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Well, we... Go back to the reference point. What reason is Paul talking about? You, you may remember a number of weeks ago now, um, in Ch Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul was starting to pray. He started that sentence for this reason. And the reason he was referring to there was the fact that Christ, through his death, has broken down the walls that divided Jew and Gentile. He's made us one body, one dwelling place in which God himself has chosen to dwell. We are the new temple. But before he got on to the prayer, he went on this Holy Spirit-inspired rabbit trail where he was explaining to us the mystery of the role of the church to be the means through which God was going to bring glory to himself before all the spiritual powers of evil in this universe, through which he was, he was going to show his manifold wisdom. And then he went on to talk about the fact that through Christ, we've all been given access to the Father. Through your faith in Jesus, you can come to the God of the universe with all of your requests, with all of your desires, with all of your needs, and you are invited to do so. And not just to come groveling, but to come into his presence with confidence, knowing that he hears you and he cares what you have to say. And now he builds on that and says, for this reason, I'm bowing my knees before the Father. He starts his prayer. And this is not the main point of the passage, but it's worth noting as we go through it, Paul bows his knees. He gets on his knees. When was the last time you got on your knees before God in prayer? We don't always have to bow the knee. Sometimes the scripture talks about prayer happening in the context of standing and raising the arms. And, and of course, we, can, we frequently pray sitting in our chairs just like you're doing now. We can bow our hearts before God, but you might be surprised how connected your heart is to your bodily posture. This is why I think it's important to raise our hands in praise, to raise our hands in prayer sometimes, even to, to clap like the scripture says sometimes when, when songs happen, and this is a longer conversation that we're not gonna get into now. And I know some of you are resistant to this idea, even though the Bible says it, you're like, yeah, but I'm clapping in my heart, and we're like, right, that's great. <laughs> Uh, clap in your heart, but sometimes your body can do it too. And it actually, uh, and even, and sometimes you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to clap because I don't feel it. Well, sometimes when you do the thing, then that actually changes how you feel. 
And the same is true with prayer. You may not be humble in God's presence. You may not be in a posture of supplication, but sometimes if you get your body in that posture, you'll discover that your heart actually follows. And so Paul bows his knees before the Father, and this is what he begins to pray for. He begins to pray for strengthening, and that strengthening comes in a few different ways. He, first of all, is gonna pray for strengthening for the indwelling presence of Christ, He's going to pray for strengthening that we might comprehend. And then he's going to pray that we would be strengthened in order to bring God glory. And so let's start with this idea of being strengthened for indwelling. He says in verse 16, he prays that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. There's so much here to digest, but the first piece of this is that this prayer is according to the riches of his glory. How rich is God's glory? We're back into the realm of immeasurable things, just like his power, just like his grace, just like his love. But the prayer is that according to the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you. When you put those two things together, there is no lack of strength you possess that he does not have enough riches of his glory to overcome. There's no limit to the degree that he can strengthen you. And he's strengthening you with power through his spirit who already dwells in your inner being or your inner man. He's talking to Christians And so he's asking for this this, this strengthening power inside of you. For what purpose? He goes on in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if you're a Christian, you might have already thought Christ was dwelling in your heart. In fact, you may even use the language, I asked Jesus into my heart. That's often how we talk about conversion. And here's the reality. If you are a Christian, Christ does already dwell in your heart by his spirit. So then what is Paul praying for here? When he prays that you would be strengthened by his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart. If he's already dwelling in your heart, what exactly are we asking for? It's not totally clear. (laughs) But I think most probably what he's asking for is an increasing sense and evidence and awareness of the fact that he is dwelling there. For an increasing sense of the rule and reign of Christ in your heart for a life that increasingly reflects the reality that Christ actually dwells in you, for more and more of the presence of Christ to be evident in you and through you, to be able to say increasingly like the Apostle Paul, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that more and more your life would be melded with his until it's no longer you we see, but him in you. This is the work of a lifetime. This is a process. And yet it's one we ought to ask for, this strengthening of Christ dwelling through faith. Do you realize that Christ dwelling in your heart is connected with your faith, with believing Where there is no faith, there's no dwelling of Christ in your heart. And to the degree that you are believing Christ dwelling in your heart is the degree to which he will be made manifest in your heart and life. C.S. Lewis has a beautiful quote in Mere Christianity where he talks about this idea of being a dwelling place for Christ and how we often don't fully appreciate what that's going to mean for us. And this is how he describes it. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. 
At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. This is what we discover in the Christian life. We invite Jesus into our life. We say, yes, come be my Lord, my Savior. And he comes in. He starts to clean up. We know the things that need addressing when he comes in. And we're glad he starts to fix those things. But then he doesn't stop. He just keeps going deeper. And he starts knocking about the house of your heart and and taking away things and, and changing things. You discover that after you become a Christian, in some ways, your life starts to get harder. You start to encounter resistance from family members that you never had before. You might discover that your career and your faith come into a conflict and one of them is not going to survive. You discover that you're you're facing new pressures and new temptations that you never dealt with before. What's going on here? Has God lost all control? And the answer is no. He's building a house. He's building a palace in which to dwell in your life. But especially as things start to get messy and, you know, you're in that reno process and it's, it's ugly and you start to wonder, why am I doing this? And it's costing a lot more than I expected. Anybody ever been through a, yeah, <laughs> it, it always costs you more than you think, right? The same is true with Jesus and his renovation. It's more costly than you thought when you signed up for it. But it's precisely in the midst of that, when you're wondering, what the world was I thinking, that you need strength to comprehend both his power to accomplish the good work he's doing and the love that is motivating the work. So that's the second thing he begins to pray for here, and that is that we would be strengthened for comprehension. He continues in verse 17 to 19, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's so much. There's so much. Let's just start at the beginning. That you being rooted and grounded in love Rooted is a agricultural metaphor. Grounded is an architectural metaphor. Both of them have to do with the love of God. Why does a tree root itself into the ground? Trees root themselves into the ground because that's where their nourishment comes from. Those roots go deep and they go wide because through the roots they draw up the water they need and the nutrients from the soil that they need to grow. Additionally, those same roots become the source of stability for the tree so that when the winds come blowing, the tree is able to stay firmly rooted in the ground because a tree on its side, uprooted, is no longer accomplishing what a tree is there for. It has other purposes at that point, but not its primary purpose. What Paul describes the Christian life, what he's praying for here, is that you would be rooted in the love of God. That your roots would go deep and wide into God's love and that his love would become the source of life and nourishment for you as a Christian. And that his love would become the source of your stability in your Christian life. So that as you're going along your journey and the winds of life come howling and the storms blow, you would be stable, firmly planted with deep roots in the love of God that the winds of life can't shake and pull you out of. You may remember, I can't remember if it was late last year or early this year, we got an unusual amount of rain for this time of year. 
And the effect of that was our yard got saturated and we have a very top heavy avocado tree that's been the source of other illustrations in sermons. <laughs> it's, it's, it's never good ones, but just, it was, anyway, this tree was very top heavy and the effect of all the rain was the ground got so saturated when the wind blew, the, the tree got uprooted, it fell over. The roots were still intact though. And so some good friends from church came over and they set the tree back up and they staked it down. And those roots are now reestablishing themselves in the soil and it's becoming increasingly sturdy and starting to, to bear fruit again, if not now, hopefully soon. Sometimes this happens to us also in the Christian life. As we're going along the way, the storms of life just knock us over. And we need somebody to come alongside us and to set us back up and to plant our roots firmly once again in the love of God, that from that love we would be nourished and strengthened and find a new stability that we not be shaken. That's what Paul's praying here, that we would be rooted, but also grounded in love. He's talking about foundations. And, and even people like me who can't build anything know that the most important thing about a building is its foundation. If you've got a building on a bad foundation, you're going to have all kinds of cracks. It's going, to be, it's going to be deforming and increasingly deforming over the course of time. It will eventually become unsafe and, and will start to fall down. And no matter how much caulk you put on the cracks or how much you try to cement those cracks, you're not dealing with the fundamental problem. And as I was sharing earlier in the sermon, so often in our Christian life, we see problems with the building of our Christian life and we start to put cracks and caulk and we try to, try to just temper the behaviors and see if we can just cover this up and put a little paint over that, thinking that, that we're somehow fixing the problem. The issue, we've got a foundational problem. Our, our Christian life is not built on the love of God as revealed to us in the person and work of Jesus. And so Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians, if, if you're building on any other foundation than Jesus Christ and the love that was made manifest in the gospel message, whatever you're building on top of that is not going to last. So Paul is praying, and my prayer for us is that our Christian lives would be established, rooted in the love of God, and built on the solid foundation of God's love. And the reality is, our building is still going to have issues. We're going to have some, some we're going to have to deal with chipped paint and, you know, leaky faucets and so on. That's the normal Christian life. But if the foundation is solid, we're going to be Okay. The love of God is both our source of nourishment as well as our firm foundation for building life upon. And this is why, this is the first prayer I wanted to pray for my kids when they entered the world. I had, not that I had thought this through, but upon reflection, I think this is, oh, I know, and, and you know, if, if our kids know nothing else when they leave our homes, what we want them to know above everything else is the love of God for them as revealed in the person and work of Jesus. And if you know nothing else after your time here at Covenant, I pray that you would know this, that your life would be rooted and grounded in the love of God revealed in the person and work of Jesus. Because no matter, else, no matter what else we might mess up, if you've got that foundation, if you're rooted in that truth, you're going to be okay. And so... He prays that you, being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of what? He does not say. He does not say. Now, if you're reading from the New International Version, an alternative translation of the Bible from the one I'm reading here, it will say the love of Christ. The Greek text doesn't say that. The translation I just read for you is the most accurate translation of what the Greek text actually says. We would expect to find in the Greek language a word in the genitive case that relates to these measurements. And what we find when we look there is he didn't finish his thought before moving on to the next one. And so scholars have debated what exactly is the height, depth, length? 
and breadth of, of what? The majority view, like the NIV translation says, is the love of Christ. And there's lots of good reasons for believing that. It's certainly a theme of this passage, as we're going to see right in the very next phrase. However, I think there are even more compelling reasons for believing that when he describes a desire for them to be strengthened, to comprehend the height, breadth, length, and, and depth, he's talking about the power of God. He wants them to comprehend God's power. Why do I say that? First reason I say that is because we only have one other example of these four dimensions used in an ancient text. It's outside the Bible, and it's actually a magical text. And it's a magical text describing some kind of supernatural power. And it uses exactly this phrase of height, breadth, length, and whatever to describe the, the dimensions of this power that's, that's essentially beyond comprehension. And so you may remember the Ephesians from the book of Acts, the Ephesians had background in magic. Many of them were converted out of a background of being involved with the magic arts. They would have been familiar with this kind of terminology used to describe power. And what the apostle Paul is doing is he's commandeering that language and he's applying it to the power of God saying, I wish you would know, I want you to know this power. It's dimensions which far exceed anything you knew in your former life. Now, the second reason why I say I think this is referring to the power of God is because this prayer is very closely related to a prayer he pray prays in chapter 1. In fact, it seems to build upon the themes of the earlier prayer we saw in Ephesians chapter 1. And listen again to what he was praying for in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. He prays that having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. He is praying that we would have strength to comprehend the unfathomable dimensions of the power of God. Do you believe that God's power is unfathomable? Or do you have a small view of his power? Do you believe he has the power to strengthen you to be a dwelling place for Christ? But it's not just power he wants them to know about. He continues, and he says in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We need strength to comprehend his power, but he also says, I want you to be strengthened to comprehend and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That doesn't make any sense, does it? How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? I guess that's why he's praying and why we ought to pray. It surpasses knowledge. You can't know this love. It's beyond your ability to know, but it's not beyond God's ability to reveal and impress upon your heart and to shape your life with. He has the power to make you know what is beyond knowing. What a prayer. It does, does God love you? Yes. Yes, of course he does. He has to love everybody. No, he doesn't. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Does he love you? Did Christ die for you? Yes, and yes. Yeah, but I'm not worthy of love. I got my whole list of reasons why God shouldn't love me, and I got my whole list of reasons why my own family doesn't love me, and I got all these, I, I'm not, I, I know why I'm not worthy of love, and, and that's what the Bible says. It's like, he didn't love you because you were worthy. 
He specifically did the greatest act of love the world has ever seen at the height of your unworthiness. Whoever you are today, whatever you've done, however unworthy you know you are, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to tell you. It was at that point of deepest unworthiness that Christ came and gave his life so that your unworthiness could be taken away, buried in the depth of the sea, never to be remembered again. That having that sin taken away, you could be reconciled to the God of the universe so that you, the unworthy person that you are and that I am, could now have a door open to us into the very throne room of God where he invites us and says, come and ask me for what you want and I'll do it for you. Does he love you, my goodness? Yes. Do you believe it? Probably not. Can we pray for it? Absolutely. And we ought to. That he would give us strength to comprehend his power and his love toward us who believe. Why? He tells us now in verse 19 that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What an interesting connection he makes here. Apart from knowing the love of Christ, you can't be filled with all the fullness of God. To the degree you know the love of Christ is the degree to which you will be filled with the fullness of God. That sentence may sound like a strange one. What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? It, too, is kind of a complicated idea, but it... Let me show you one of the other places in Scripture where this phrase is used, and this may help you understand what he's saying about you. In Colossians chapter 2, 9, and 10, the Apostle Paul is describing Jesus, and he says, For in Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Christ, who is the head of all rule and authority." All the fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus, and Jesus dwells in you. And Paul prays that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. I think what he's talking about here is just an ever-increasing in dwelling of Christ in the fullness of who he is as the living God in us. It's beyond our knowing. It's beyond our strength. And so he prays that we would be strengthened to know and experience this reality. And that brings us to the final piece. Prayer that we would be strengthened for his glory. Paul prays in verses 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This prayer he's making to the God who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. What do you think God is able to do? He can do more. How are you limiting God's power with your small imagination of his greatness? Do you long to be free of the habits and the patterns of behavior that you hate? God has the power. Do you believe it? Do you long to be a person who's filled with love and patience and humility and self-control? You should. Do you believe God has the power to make you that kind of person? He does. 
And we ought to ask him. And we ought to ask him with eager anticipation that he will do in and for us these very things. Our problem is not that we ask too much of God, but that we ask so little because we think so little of what he's able to do. We just, we just think he's like a slightly bigger version of us. And we're like, I could never do that. I can't help somebody overcome that sin in their life. I can't help somebody change their posture towards that person they hate. I can't. No, you can't. But we're not talking about you. We're talking about him. The same power that, that split the sea. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. The same power that stopped the sun. The same power that is renewing the whole of creation is at work in you. He's able. Will you ask him? And keep on asking him. How do you think about the power of God? Because that's what he's saying. He's, he can do this according to the power at work within us. How great is that power? How do you think about the power of God? Do you think about the power of God like he's like, you know, it's like triple A batteries that run the thermostat on my wall. And then, you know, that's important. Is that how you think about God's power, like triple A batteries? Or do you think about his power like, like an electrical socket? That's a power. There's some significant power. You put a butter knife in that socket, you'll discover power. <laughs> or do you think of his power like a nuclear power plant? That's another level of power. And even still, we're thinking too small. It, the, we need a bigger view of his power. We need strength to comprehend the power of God so that we'll ask him for the things that are actually worthy of God. The things we actually need. The things he actually wants to do in us and through us. When we underestimate the power at work within us, we underask God for what we need. And so our prayer is that we would have strength to comprehend his power and his love. And that he's using this power and motivated by this love to do far more abundantly in and through us anything we could ask or imagine. And he just wants us to ask him and to keep asking. Phillips Brooks, I'm going to close with this, preacher, earlier century. And I think he got it right when he said this. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. Every day you shall wonder at the richness of life that has come to you by the grace of God. He invites you to pray this way. You can't do it for yourself. I can't do it for you. I can't do it for me. But we can ask him. And he's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. So brothers and sisters, let's stand firm in this love. Let's stay rooted and grounded in the love of God for us in Christ. Let's ask God to expand our comprehension, to strengthen us in the inner man that we might believe at the core of who we are that we are loved, that we might believe at the core of who we are that there is an infinite power at work in us and for us. And that we, the church, along with Christ Jesus, would stand eternally to his praise and glory through all generations. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us that we so frequently think of you in such small ways. We think of your love as being so measly and your power as being so weak. And we're limited and constrained by our own love and by our own power and weakness. Lord, this morning you've opened our eyes and I pray that you'll open our hearts as well. That you'll strengthen us to comprehend your great power, your infinite love. 
that we would ask you for the things that we need, for the transformation that we need, that we might become increasingly a fit dwelling place for Christ, that we might become vessels through which you manifest your glory in this world and through every generation, that we would love you as you deserve to be loved, that we would walk in obedience as you deserve to be obeyed, that we would wait with eager anticipation for you to do far more abundantly than all we could have asked or imagined. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.